know where that comes from. UEC Surulere, Christian Youth Fellowship. With Jesus' joy, let's welcome to bring forth his word, Dr. Mike Umo. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God Almighty. I consider it a very, very big privilege and honor to be asked to come here today to minister and share the word of God with you. I want to first of all appreciate the leadership of the church. Thank you very much, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you to the elders and the entire church committee for this um, opportunity. Um, I also want to thank the leadership of the Youth Fellowship and the Youth Fellowship entirely for this great opportunity. Um, I believe that the Lord is set to drop a word or two in our hearts. And I pray that even as his word comes forth, it will come with power and with light in Jesus' mighty name. Um, briefly, I'm going to take a text from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11 from verse 28 to 32. Because we don't have much time, I'm just going to run through it and then we go straight to what God is said to do. He says from 28, Then he shall return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south but it shall not be as the former or as the later. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his path, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. We bless the Lord for his reading. Father, Lord in heaven, I thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you because we know that your word is light. We pray, O oh God Almighty, that even as your word comes forth, there is illumination all over this auditorium. And I ask, Father, Lord Jesus, that that which you have sent me here to do, you will do with precision and accuracy in Jesus' name. Now, the scripture we have read is from the book of Daniel. I'll just give a brief background so that we understand where we are coming from. Now, this book was a prophecy that the Lord had given to Daniel. In fact, it, is, it can be said that this is one of the most accurate or precise and detailed prophecies because from verse 1, which we did not read because of the time, from verse 1, he talked about certain things that would happen in sequential order, and all these things came to pass. But this verse that we talked about here just gives the brief background of a tussle that happened between two certain people. The first of them is Antiochus of Epiphanes and Judas Maccabeus. Now, when I was told to give a sermon or to give a teaching, and I was told that the theme was emerging strong, and I asked God, what would you have me say? What would you have me preach to these people? And he pointed this particular verse in my direction. Now, to be very quick and go straight to the point, there are two verses I want to really pinpoint or pick upon. And that is the first 28 and 32. All right? Verse 28 says, He shall return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he will do exploits. Now, if you notice, there's a word in this scripture that appears twice. And that is the word exploits. Now, we might ask, what is exploit? What does it mean to do exploit? Right? Now, this is the king at that time who was opposing the will of God. And he says his heart will be against the holy covenant. And the scripture calls it exploits. Now, if you go down to verse 32, it also says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant, he will corrupt them with flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So now, that is two places where the word exploit is mentioned. Exploit as evil, and then this kind of exploit. And the Lord has told me this morning to share on a very simple theme. It says, the kingdom way 
to exploit. Because there are exploits and there are exploits. The first one you can see, we call it exploits. But then that is not what God will accredit or acknowledge as exploits. Now, before we can even understand what exploits is, we have to first of all define terms. Because a great man said, wherever the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. So we have to first of all define what it means to do exploits. Definitions are very key and important. And if there is no definition, if there is no purpose, there is no set or clear outline of what we want or what we are talking about, then subsequently there is going to be abuse. And that's what's happening in certain places all over the world. If you go to some of the great nations of the world right now, because of the fundamental problem with defining clear terms, there are issues and there are problems. If you go to the United States of America, for example, the USA, and you pick a random sample of about 10 people, put them in a room and ask a simple question, how many genders do we have in the world? An argument is going to come up. There's going to be a tussle because the simple definition of what gender is has been twisted. So first of all, we're going to study clear. What does it mean to do exploits? But first of all, in verse 32, he says, those that know their God will be strong and do exploits, which means that there is a prerequisite for doing exploits, and that is knowing your God. And so before we even talk about exploits, we're going to talk about what it means to know God, what it means to know a person. You say, I know this person, I know this man, I know this woman. What does it mean to know God? Now, knowing here is not just about knowing a person physically. I know this person in church, I know this person from my school, I know this person from my house. No, 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 no. That's not the knowing it talks about. In fact, the word knowing that is used here, in the Hebrew, it's called yada. Knowing yada, which means a specific kind of knowing that comes only from intimacy. This kind of knowing is not the kind of knowing that is just ordinary. It is the same thing that was used in the book of Genesis. Genesis 4 verse 1, where the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve, and they begat Cain. Now, you know that for Adam and Eve to give birth to Cain, it's not just that I know you, I know you. Okay? There must have been an intimacy for that to happen. So that yada talks about intimacy. That is the kind of knowing that we talk about. So when you enter this type of knowing, enter this sphere or this level of knowledge, then we can talk about beginning to do exploits. Another thing about knowing God here, I'll tell you that it is not even the same thing as being born again. It's not the same thing as giving your life to Christ. That is not knowing. Because this same word, yada, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, is ginosko. Ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And if you look at the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, take note. The person talking here was not Saul. It was Paul. In other words, the person who is saying he wants to know God is not the person who was persecuting. It's the person after he had encountered Christ in Damascus. He had had that change, has written letters to churches all over, and he still says, I want to know God. That shows you that the knowledge here is not just knowing God as Lord and personal Savior. It is intimacy. It is the kind of knowing that can only come from fellowship and communion when you spend time with God. And it is important that we take note of this, because in order to do exploits, we must first of all know God. We must first of all know God. Now, the time is quickly fast spent. Okay, and now... Um, because of this, it is important that we set our minds to engage in the spiritual disciplines of knowing God, which means to study, to study the word of God, to engage in prayer. This is the prerequisite for us to do exploits. Because if we do not do this, if we do not engage in prayer, if we do not engage in study of the word of God, if we do not take time to seek the face of God, we cannot do what Christ calls or regards as exploits. Now, because of the way Things have gone. The times have changed now. And in this time and generation, the attention span is very short. So people cannot even sit down for minutes or hours to pray or study. A research was done which shows that the attention span of the average human has dropped over the years. In the year 2000, the attention span was 12 point, which means that if we are having a com conversation, it takes 12.5 seconds. If I don't pick your interest or catch your fancy, the person loses attention. Mind goes off. Now, over the years, presently, the attention span has dropped by 25%. So now it is 8.25, which means that we are going on a decline. It is important because knowing God will require that we focus our mind and put our attention on the Lord God Almighty. Now, when we have known God and when we have taught, then we can begin to do exploits. Now, I'll talk briefly on what it means now to do exploits, kingdom exploits, like I've talked about. First of all, I'll say that kingdom exploits is not measured by temporal activity. 
Kingdom excellence is not measured by earthly accomplishments, but rather by eternal significance. In other words, in the meter in heaven, as it is written, it's not the person who works the most here that is said to have done exploits. It is the person who has worked according to the will of God. Now, that will of God, which can only be obtained when you enter a place of intimacy with the Father, that is when you'll be able to say that you have done kingdom exploits. Now, this brings us back to the story of Mary and Martha. If you notice, the, the, the ways of the kingdom are quite different from the way we function in the world. The kingdom of God operates above logic. It doesn't cancel logic. It doesn't cancel common sense and thinking. God created the brain. God created thinking and logic and common sense. And when God made these things, he said it was good. In other words, it's not like logic is bad. But then there is a law and there's a rule. There are principles that rise higher than logic. It doesn't cancel it, but goes higher than it. And this is the rule that will define what exploit is. In this realm or in this um, place where this superior thinking of the kingdom comes into play, there are certain things that we will consider as exploits on earth that are not exploits in heaven. For example, Jesus Christ went to visit Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Martha was busy walking around. Now, according to the human mind, you will think that Jesus Christ will appreciate Martha and say, yes, this is what it is. You are served, at least the person is serving Jesus, trying to serve the Lord. But no, he says, what is important at this point is what Mary is doing, sitting down at the feet to listen, sitting down at the feet to hear what I have to say. Now, according to that whole scenario and conversation that played on there, Mary was the one who did exploits. You might think Martha was the one because of the moving up and down. The no, Mary was the one who did exploits. And so that shows us that kingdom exploits cannot be measured by mere human knowledge and thinking. You have to be able to understand what God is saying concerning a particular situation, not follow the masses or follow the crowd. And that is when you can see that you have achieved kingdom exploits. Kingdom exploits is Christ-centered. In other words, everything revolves around Jesus Christ. In anything you do, if you cannot point it back to Christ, we cannot consider it as exploit. Now, you will see that from the scriptures we read, this battle that was fought between Antonius, Epiphanes, and Judas Maccabeus, the one I read earlier, is eventually heralded or led to winning wars that could ensure that God's people were preserved so that Christ could come. So ultimately, the end was to show forth the glory of Christ. And so if Christ is not in it, it cannot be considered as exploits. If Christ is not in it, it cannot be considered an exploit. It must be able, you must be able to point it back to Jesus Christ. And then we say, this is exploit. Now, I'm going to quickly talk about two things. How do you know that something, what you're doing is exploit and what you're doing is not exploit? How can you differentiate between what is kingdom exploit and what is exploit according to the world? First of all, is that it must always be connected to the will of the king. You will understand that God is the king of kings. If it is against his will, then we can say that that is not exploit according to the kingdom. But then it must be connected to the king because it came to bring us into a kingdom. And in that kingdom, Christ has children. That's why God calls us king of kings. I'll do a brief analogy and compare kingdoms so we understand what I'm talking about. When we say the kingdom of God, you can liken it to, let's say, the, the, the British kingdom where you have the queen of England, right? And the queen has children, many children. Now, because of that, the queen or the king currently, because the queen is late, now the king of England, we can say that he is the king and every other person answers to him because God is king and we become children of God when we believe in Christ. We have entered into that communion of royalty. So we are kings. We are servants and we are also kings. So when they say God is king of kings, he's the king of us kings. Now, the king has given us kings Areas to dominate. That's why in the book of Genesis, when he gave his commandment, he said, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. So God has given us dominion over certain spheres in the world around us. Just like the queen. Because the queen still, or because the king rather, still reigns on the throne. And he has children that are royalty. Now, what happens because a king, when he has children that are princes and princesses, one day the king will die. And the princes and princesses will become king and inherit or begin to rule. Now, God is a king that doesn't die. Now, consider that how do the children of God exert kingly influence when the king is still alive? That is why God said, let us make a realm, that is earth, in our, make man in our likeness and send him to earth. And he says, come here and make, take dominion. Now, if you look, notice from the 
British Empire, the way it is also, because the king is still alive, his children are given specific portions of areas of geography to administer their influence, their kingly influence on. For example, you have somebody like Prince, Prince, um, Prince Charles, or Prince Harry, for example. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. All right, so now this particular land is given to him. He says, administer your kingly role or activities right here. That is what God has done for us in that he is king above in heaven and starts to earth and says, on earth, I have given you this field. Mr. John, I'm giving you the field of business. I need you to take dominion and perform the kingdom mandates in that sphere. Mrs. Lois, I'm giving you the field of music. I need you to take dominion in that place and make sure that my authority and my influence is felt. And so, because we answer to the king, we need to get the blueprint of how to live our lives from the king. And that is what you get by intimacy. So when you stay with God and say, God, where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? And how do you want me to do it? And you do those things according to the plan of God, then it is called exploits. When you move out of that and go on to do other things, then we cannot regard that as exploit because it's outside of the will of God. So first of all, it's always connected to the will of the king. Secondly and finally, as I begin to bring this to a close, kingdom exploits will always be rooted in love. I'm going to bring a very short story as I round up quickly. Now, while I was still in medical school training, I had colleagues who had big dreams and aspirations. And I was speaking with one of them, very brilliant doctor. And he says, in the future, I'm going to establish one of the greatest genetic centers in Africa, all right, to conduct clinical and molecular medicine such that the world has never seen before. And I said, this is a good um, dream. This is good um, aspiration. These are good goals. I said, why do you want to do it? And he said, I want to show the world, I want to show the white people that Africans can do something great. And I said, well, that is good. These are good dreams. But you see, the motive behind it, the motive behind it, if it is not driven by love, then that motive, that particular dream, you can consider it as flawed. And I said, look at this. Jesus Christ did not come to die for you, give you the wisdom, give you the mind you have to study medicine for you to come out and try to show people something. Now, the idea that you want to show people, I want to show them this, I want to show them, it is not scriptural and it is not kingdom. The kingdom is love. God gives two commandments. Love the Lord, love your neighbor. And I said, this is what is going to happen. The moment you change it, I said, look at it this way. I want you to approach it from this perspective. You say, I want to build this center because I love the children of Africa. They are suffering and so I want to help them, help these people so that there will be great medical research in the continent of Africa. Let it be love focused and in that way you will achieve and accomplish what you want to do and not fall prey to certain devices or schemes that will pull you away from the scheme of God. So, the kingdom is always love oriented. If it is not love oriented, if it is not centered around Christ, then we have every reason and every cause to doubt it. With this, I hope I have been able to shed some light on what exploit is according to the kingdom, because exploit is not according to what you see in the world. Remember from the scripture, two parts, exploit. First person was against the holy covenant, and second was against the person who tried to stand against the will of God. This is what kingdom exploits is. And I pray that the power of the Lord God Almighty is going to bless this word into our hearts and make us see the light, the true light of what it means to be strong and do exploit. I pray that the youths of this generation will not follow the masses, bandwagon effects, wherever everybody is going, you want to go there. I pray that we will have strong youths who will stand up, who will stand up in the place of prayer and devotion and commitment to listen to what God has to say and pattern their lives after Christ.